so th this is really the point in the class where we really kind of go from, I want to go from finite, finite dimensional quantum mechanical systems and, and what's in a standard kind of uh, physics quantum mechanics class to, to talk about quantum field theories, and the, which are infinite dimensional um, systems and which, you know, in, in a typical f physics sequence are going to be taught in a separate class. And I, if you've taken both these classes, if you take both these classes, what you'll notice is that the, the methods that, that people used to define the theory and kind of shift quite a bit when typically when you go from quantum mechanics to quantum field theory. And, um, and, and, and speci so specifically, there's uh, kind of different ways of thinking about quantization, um, you know, kind of using Lagrangians and path integrals, which are much more popular if pe when people are teaching quantum field theory for various reasons. And so the typical undergrad, typical first quantum mechanics class doesn't, doesn't use those methods. It uses methods not that different than the ones I've been talking about. And, uh, but then when you start doing quantum field theory, people in physics typically go to uh, start, you know, kind of motivate the quantum field theory calculations by a different set of methods. So what, what I want to do today is kind of a, um, <laughs> kind of an, an intermediate step between going, between what I've been doing so far in the class before we start talking about quantum field theory, is I want to kind of explain what these other quantization methods are that are that, that typically get used if you if like if you go and pick up a book on quantum field theory this is most likely what you're you're likely to see it's going to turn out that i'm going to try and talk about quantum field theory in a language that's closer to the um the standard quantum mechanical language i, I won't really be using the path integral or the um or these lagrangian methods but i, I really kind of want to, want to explain what they are and what they um what they have what they have to do with them, um, what the relationship is between these methods and the methods we've been talking about so far. So that's kind of what today, what I wanted to do today. So this is going to be a little bit in, informal. I'm, I'm trying to, um, you know, I, I don't want to, I, I don't really have time or, or want to kind of go through the, the details of kind of the standard motivations and calculations given these things in a, in a which, which you'll see in a typical physics class. Um, but I'll try to, try to explain a little bit about this happens. And if you've taken a more advanced physics class in which they actually use these methods, this, this should look very familiar. And, um, and please, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll try to kind of explain the relationship between these methods and the methods we've been talking about before, which is, which is actually, I think it's, it's not normally kind of acknowledged that it's actually a fairly complicated subject. There, there's not such a, there's not a completely straightforward way to understand the relationship between these two different sorts of methods. There's a, it's a fairly tricky, you know, relating them precisely is a fairly tricky business. And so I want to kind of, anyway, that's what I kind of want to do today, but um, yeah, so it'll be a little bit more informal and, um, but, but definitely st please stop me if you see anything that you're trying to, that you're not, you know, that you're not understanding, especially if you've seen some of this before and then, um, and, and you, um, I think I think you know there there may be, there may be a lot of question obvious questions which come up about uh, about about the relation about what I'm try, trying to tell you because I'm not really going to go into in, I'm not really intending to go into all that much detail but you know if you stop me at any point we can uh, talk a, a bit more in detail about things okay okay so let's get started okay so the first first part of the story actually is goes back not not to um. Not to, not to quantum mechanics classes, but, but to classical mechanics classes. But if you took a class in classical mechanics, so remember, what, what I've been doing is I've always been doing ha Hamiltonian mechanics. So, so it's, it's Hamiltonian. Mechanics. And, and, and here the story is that your, um, your, your, your basic object is a phase space. And you've got you've got um, coordinates q, q j, and p j. So you've got you've got position like and momentum like coordinates, but they but there's a kind of a, you're you're exploiting kind of a symmetry between the two. You exploit there's this kind of underlying um, symplectic symmetry of the situation that you can you can you can there's symmetries that mix q's and, and p's which you can work with, and that's and and then you have a you have a Hamiltonian.
function function you know function a a h which is it's just some some function of the cube a and p j. Okay. And so this is just a an R Q D. So it's a human dimensional phase space. And the various ways of thinking about what you're doing here is you can think of the at the phase space is really the um, oh and, and then the the dynamics is given by uh, as Hamilton's equations. And so Hamilton's equations are first order equations. And so what you should what you should think of this phase space as doing is this phase space is really kind of telling you um, if you've got some kind of equation of some kind of um, equation of motion, to put it in a Hamiltonian form means to put it in kind of a first order form so that the um, that you know that the the the, the, the initial data just no, knowing and then the space the phase space is the space of initial data for the uh, you know, for, for this equation of motion. So that if you know once you've picked a point in phase space, you've picked out a unique you picked out a unique classical trajectory. And it's going to be determined by Hamilton's equations, this Hamilton function. Okay. And then the more kind of subtle part of this thing, the thing which really encapsulates the uh, symplectic invariance of the whole thing, is the Poisson bracket. It is, it's the Poisson bracket. But now the, the other, right, is Lagrangian. So it, if, you, if you take a course in classical mechanics, you'll, I mean, you may see this whole, so this whole story, but you'll also, but you'll, you'll often be, be told kind of a, a different story and give it a different kind of formalism for, for, for doing uh, this, the same sort of thing. But in, in Lagrangian, in, in Lagrangian mechanics, you, you really think about the basic thing as a, a configuration space. So the so so you don't necessarily have the the PJs. You just have you have you have QJs, which are which are our positions of things. And your the basic problem you're often thinking about is if you if you have the um, you know if if you know the position you're you're interested in if you know the positions of a bunch of things at a certain time, what are they going to do later? And the typical kind of equation of motion you're going to have is going to be a, a second order equation motion, so it's going to depend not just on on the on the QJs, but also on the on their time on their time derivatives. So you're you're to so the um so but you also so what you also have is you you also have uh, you yeah, yeah you also think about the the time derivatives of the Q, of the QJ and in so, and so in in some sense. Instead of thinking about QJ and PJ, you're thinking about QJ and QJ dot. And and, and if your um, equation of motion is some kind of second order equation, you know these guys are going to give you the initial data, and you can and, and there's not that much difference between the Lagrangian and the, and the Hamiltonian form that we'll see. But uh, but this, uh, if you've got um, equations of motion that are like higher degree than two or some exotic things and then these these formalisms are going to be kind of different. Okay, but now, in, in so in, instead of having the the Hamiltonian function, what you have is uh, you have a, a, a Lagrangian. function. Or maybe it's better to think of fun, 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 function L of the Q and Q and Q uh, uh, okay. So what you've got is some, some kind of some kind of function which uh, it, 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 take, it takes does something to the Q of T's and does something to the Q, Q, Q dot of T's. It takes takes this is some function of, of these two things at each time. Okay. This is called the, called the Lagrangian, and then the um, and then, then what you define is then, then what you define is the um, 
and then for a path a path or a, 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 a for a, tra a trajectory um, so I'll tell it's called gamma which is Q of T Q so the idea is that you've got some kind of this thing is move. This thing is thing is moving around at each time, starting at some t zero, ending at I don't know, t one, and at each t, you've got you, you've got q of t variables that tell you where you are, and you've got a you've got a velocity vector, um, which is that which which is components of the velocity vector to tell you give you this guy. Okay, okay so so for a trajectory, you define. Find something called the action, the S of gamma. Or on L. Okay. So the so the and the the, the, ba the basic object of this Lagrangian point of view is okay, so your basic variables are our position and velocity, and their the dynamics. It, it depends. If there's some function of them which is going to tell you about the dynamics, and what this this gets encapsulated in um, in a in, in this integral. So for for any for any for any trajectory that you can imagine, you just you can, you you can, you can compute this number. So this this is now a this is now a function on an infinite dimensional space. The infinite dimensional space of all paths. From from here, anyway, uh, uh, infinite dimensional space of all paths, if you like. Okay, so so, so then you're um. Okay, okay. So so now. Now, now you need some you need some analog of the um, of the principle of Hamilton's equations, which which told you you know given this um, the Hamil the Hamiltonian function the Hamiltonian function how do you how do you figure out you know th th this is a functional on, on, on any on any trajectory. So what you want to do is you want to identify though the, um, the the certain special trajectories, which are the trajectories that are going to solve your equations of motion that are going to be your 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 kind of class your the, the, the paths of your thought that, that you're, you're you're actually going to follow it if you if you're in, in this classical mechanical system. So you, if you know if you start at a certain t zero with a certain velocity, this is this is you have to you, there's there's one particular trajectory which is what you're going to do later, and so you want to know what that is, and so well first let's go let's let's define this. So what is this? Okay, let me well, let, 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 let me let me not do do this for it. Well, let's let me let me do it. Let me just let me just say, say this. So the, here's the basic principle. Okay. Okay. The uh, um, the classical. Uh, so the system will evolve. The, 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 the solutions will be on uh, Lagrangian, Lagrangian system. Will um, be be, tra be trajectories gamma such that say delta s of gamma is equal to zero. Okay, and what this means, meaning meaning uh, gamma. 
gamma is, is a critical point. You know, for, 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 the, for the functional function S. Okay, so it, it's just like in, um, <coughs> yeah, if, if this were actually a function of a, on a finite dimensional space or on a one dimensional space, this, the, the, this would be, it's just saying that, that the derivative at, at that point was zero, so it was a critical point, and so this is the kind of behavior you would expect if you're at a maximum or a minimum. And what, what you'd like what you'd like to say is that the um, so the the idea you, you so what you often say is that the um, the solutions are 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 the minima minimize the action. Yeah, so, so, so this, I don't know if I call it, so this is called the action, minimize the action. So there's, there's something a little bit funny about this, that you're not, you're, you're, you're not actually, you're not actually so much minimizing the action as you're looking, you're looking for critical points. And if you actually had an absolute minimum, if you actually had an absolute minimum for the action, then you would expect it to, to be a critical point. But 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 the um, one kind of mis one kind of slightly funny thing about this whole idea is that you're actually you're often getting um, critical points which are not necessarily mi not necessarily minima of the action. So there's this kind of idea that this is kind of the the so-called um, so so-called principle of least action, um, and that the idea is that the in some great philosophical philosophical sense, the way to understand why mechanical systems work they are work the way they are is that there's this function, the action function, which tells you which got, which which is a function on all possible trajectories, and it, 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 if you can figure out how to minimize it, that's your classical trajectory. So this this sounds very good, but but that's, that's what you're, this, this is, but th this is actually what you're trying to do. Okay, so you have you have to think, you have to worry a little bit about this, and this is what I, I'm not sure I want to spend too much time on, but to figure out you know what what do you actually mean by um, so you have to so you need to need to to to, to, to de define carefully the um, del delta. Delta. So this is so because because so in, in some sense what this is in some sense is it's a um, it's kind of a derivative uh, you know, in infinite dimensions. So you, I mean, you've got this. The problem is that your space of all trajectories is infinite dimensional, and you're say I want to kind of find a critical point of this of this function on an infinite dimensional space. So I want Anyway, so 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 the, the, what you're what you're saying is that when you're saying this, you're saying that basically that for for any there's you know if you're at a, if you're at a, a classical trajectory, a solution a, at a solution, if you try and move, um, you know, if you move your trajectory infinitesimally in, in any um, in any direction in, in this infinite dimensional space, you're going to um, you know yeah, you're, you're going to get zero to first order. That's what this is saying. So anyway, you have to kind of make you have to think about exactly you know what exactly what what it means was to make exact sense of what when I'm saying that. I don't want to try and do that really here. But the, the, the basic theorem is this that delta is that delta. So, so, so delta S of gamma is um, equal to zero for all um, uh, infinite, infinitesimal well, uh, variations of um, of gamma with 
endpoints. Let's see, um, gamma, gamma T1. So what I'm saying, so what I'm saying, and anyway, and the, the idea is that this, that this, this condition here is equivalent to, to the condition um, DL. I'm going to run out of it. Um, DL, DL, DQ dot, DQJ minus DDT. So this is so, so, this, so this equation is called the the, the Euler Lagrange equation. Okay. And so, so so this is going to be your analog before in the in the, in the Hamiltonian formalism you had uh, Hamilton's equations which if you fed them with the the Hamiltonian function they would give you a differential equation which told you um, how p's and q, you know, how p's and q's were going to evolve. What this, what this guy is, this is something which you feed at the Lagrangian function of q and q dot, and then it gives you a a, a differential equation, um, which is going to tell you how the how the how the q's are how the q's are going to evolve. So that's the idea. Okay, I'm trying to let, let me kind of quickly. Well, let me. I'm not. I'm not sure. So, so I, I could. I can go through the. Um, let me very quickly kind of outline how how you how you do this. It, it, it's honestly not the world's most enlightening calculation, though. But it's um. Anyway, the 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 bottom line is what's what's interesting. But there there are. It is crucial the whole point of the things. So what you do is you um. So 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 the, pr the proof of this is basically you're gonna what you're gonna do is you're gonna show that the 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 the, ver that the variation of, of if if you make a small variation in the trajectory of, by delta of q of t, then the s is is then at about a trajectory gamma that delta s is going to be the um. The interval from t1 to t2 of the, the change. So the change in this L function of q and q dot dt, but that's going to be some kind of. Um, so it's going to be the interval from t1 to t2. And then there's going to be a dl dq dot so dq. The LDQ and then a delta Q of T plus the L D Q dot delta Q dot T. And then what you do, D T. And then what, what you do is you use that delta Q dot uh, T is um, DDT is the front DDT of your your chain, your variation in. Of Q, so your basic thing you're doing is you're you're, you're changing a trajectory. You're starting at gamma. You're you're you're, you're changing gamma to some to, to, to gamma plus delta Q of T. And so where, where where the idea is that this is supposed to be something kind of infinitesimal. You're only interested in what happens to first order in this in, in this change. And 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 okay. So the way the velocity is going to change is by the derivative of this guy, and then what you do is you just do anyway. You basically do a calculation with it with a um, integration by using integration by parts and re rearrange terms. And what you get is that this is the the you get that this is the integral from t one to t two of dl dq uh, minus dt.
um, delta Q. Okay. Q. So it's, it's got a term like this. And then, but then there's then there's also going to be a term um, minus the L D Q dot. And then the delta Q coming from the integration by parts. This is going to be there's going to be some boundary terms. What happens at, at T two and what happens at T uh, T one. Okay. Anyway, so, so you can see, having the notes in a little bit more detail, or, or any physics book has a lot more detail about this, but it's basically, so, so, so this, this equation comes from this. So what this says, if you want this to be a critical point, if you want this to be zero for, for any del delta Q to first order, this term has got to be zero. So, so this, that's what, so, so, so this gives you, gives you this, gives you the, the Lagrange equation. But, but and, and I said I was doing, I was looking at infinitesimal variations with endpoints fixed. And so, so, so these terms are zero. But, 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 but these terms are also interesting. So I'll, I'll come back to this in a minute. But just, just notice that, um, so yes, yeah, so, so the variation of, of the action is, it has this kind of bulk, bulk term that depends upon the, uh, you know, every point in the trajectory. And, and setting that equal to zero is going to be the Euler-Lagrange equation. But it's also got these, these boundary terms. And, and so there's an interesting object. This is this DL DQ dot and delta Q that if you make a certain um, yeah, that, 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 that you, you could also imagine changing, you could, you could also imagine doing changes at, 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 at the boundaries. And if this, um, if this variation is going to be zero, then these, the, the, these two terms are going to have to cancel. So we'll, we'll come back to that a little bit later. But um, for, 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 this, for this part of the argument, these are terms are zero anyway. Okay. Okay. So let's, maybe let's do a, anyway, so, so then the basic example, the simple example is just standard mechanics where you take, um, where, where you want to recover, um, You want to recover Newton's kind of second law of an amp potential. So then, what you just do is you take um, so a particle. So the example of a particle and potential. Um, L of Q and Q dot. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll just write this for one degree of freedom. But in in, in general, it's you know, a lot of them. It, it's one. One half m q dot squared minus d of q. So it's the the one way to remember this is that the, the Hamiltonian is the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. The Lagrangian is the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. Okay. But it's that. And then the 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 Lagrange equation, the Euler Lagrange equation, which I know. So 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 this. If you figure out what, what this guy being equal to zero says now, he says that. Um, let's see. So, the derivative of this respect to Q, which, which is um, that's minus dv dQ. Um, is going to be equal to the ddt of this, but dldq dot is a half m times two q dot, so it's q dot. So you get um, you get m times uh, ddt of m q dot, which is m q dot. Okay, and so this is just then your standard kind of you know, f is equal to ma kind of. Uh, version mechanics. Okay, so that's the the, the standard story. So, so, so this is kind of often sold as kind of a uh, a jazzed up version of the standard Newtonian mechanics that you're you're taught about that f is equal to ma, which corresponds to this kind of this kind of Lagrangian. But you can start thinking about you know 
what what if what if I cha change the Lagrangian function? If I, um, you know, anyway, anyway, if I if I add term, if I add, I mean, anyway, you can think of all sorts of things you can imagine doing to have a, a, a more complicated Lagrangian than this, and then you can create new Lagrangian mechanical systems. Okay, so now what about um? So so what's the relationship between this point of view and the Hamiltonian point of view? Um, so what you what you so the the kind of the, the kind of ugly truth of the matter is that in in general the relationship is very complicated. In, in general, these are two <laughs> these are two quite different things. But if you um, but in in a good case, what happens? The Hamiltonian mechanics. Is that it is, is this that what you do is you take um so you define PJ is the L E Q dot J. And then what you want to and, and so, so the idea then is that this this then gives you so so ch changing from coordinates qj qj dot to qj pj so 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 this this is given a name so this is a this is given a name of uh, the, the Legendre transform. And in, in, in good cases, this is, yeah, this is a, um, yeah, this is a, Hey, you know, this this is this is just some some nice invertible one to one. This is just a one to one map between, um, you know, this is, is my my phase space R two D, and this this is, again is, is an R two D. And you know, in in good cases, this is a um, is a let me say you know, this is a different morphism. I mean, You know, all, 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 all I mean is that this is this is a one to this is a one to one infinitely differential map that you can kind of that these are this is really a nice a nice identification of, of these spaces in in good cases and so if this is true if you're in a good case then what you can do is you can just go back and forth between all you've really done is all you've really done is you've kind of rewritten um, you yeah. You've, 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 you, you can treat you can treat this guy just as a phase space. It's just that there's a slight that you know there's a slightly funny choice of, uh, of variables that you've decided to use q dot instead of p p, p in, in, instead of p as as your variable. But you know if, if if this map is nice and one to one and differential and everything, there's, there's really no problem kind of just going going back and forth between the two pictures. But the problem. Um, is that is that sometimes okay? Oh, and, 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 and a good example, example of the um, of the in, in the in the uh, in the particle in a potential um, part of it. Then you have dl dl dq dot j is so you, so so th th this depends upon the velocities as a half. Times the mass times the velocity squared. So if you differentiate with respect to this, you get P is just uh, PJ is, is PJ is just the mass times Q. Right. So if if L is a half, if the dependence of, of L on the velocities is a half times the mass times the velocity squared, 
then pj is, is just the mass times the times the velocity. So the only difference between working in velocity um, variables and working in momentum variables p is just this, this factor of m. So it's, it's, it's really you really everything is really exactly the same. But the problem. So the, the reason, the, uh, the thing that's a bit, it's a bit misleading about this whole story is that very often that there, there are many interesting systems where it turns out where this is not a diffeomorphism or something where something goes to go seriously wrong with this. And then the, um, so the problem is that, let me, let me give an exam, a good example is in electrodynamics. And, and, and by this I mean that, let's say that you let's you want to study the um, you want to study Maxwell's equations and so Maxwell's equation is just in a vacuum just you got these um, you can think of them as um, a, a, as a bunch of equations for E and B fields or equations for the vector potential but in terms of the vector potential Um, then what you have is that so 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 the Lagrangian is um, e vector squared minus d vector squared, and if you if you try if you write this out in terms of in, in terms of vector potential of the vector potential, so this is well, then what you find is that dl l d um, a zero dot. So one one it says so the vector potential is some is kind of this four component thing whose time you know, its time derivatives give you of the, the time derivatives. Well, the space the space the, sp the space derivatives of the of the space components of the A's give you the B field, and the time derivatives of the space components of the of, 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 of the of the A give you the E fields, but but th this does not depend on it doesn't depend and I mean, there, there's nowhere in here that the time derivative of, of, of the time component of, of the vector potential occurs. Okay. So so this is equal to zero. Okay. So, 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 so this, so, so something bad has happened that you've got this, this nice, what, what looks like this nice space here to define in terms of, in terms of the, in this case, the A, let's say, let's say A, A mu and A mu dot, the vector potentials and, and, the, and the, this, and if you try and do this here, um, DL, the A mu, A mu. Uh, if you try and use these as, as, as your, anyway, anyway you're, you're, you're looking for trajectories which are, are given by, by solving for these A mu functions, but they, um, one of them is zero. So, 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 so this is taking a, a space of a certain dimensionality and dropping it down to a space to a, to a, a space of, of a, um, a, a one dimension less. Okay, because one, one of these one of these guys is going to be a zero. And the problem when you do that is that th this this no longer can be a um, yeah so 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 this implies that you can't um, you can't get a get, get an even dim, an even dimension um, phase space when you're so it, so you you're you, you lose one dimension, and so whatever you know, your your Legendre transform has taken you has taken the space where you're trying to study these trajectories, and and identified it with a, a space of what which has that you know, just doesn't have the right properties to, to, to be a um to, to, to be a Hamiltonian to, to be a to be a phase space, and so the, the whole Hamiltonian um, formalism gets gets kind of mucked up by this. And, and and you end up having you end up having to talk about what's called um, constrained uh, 
melatonin. And, and typically, I mean, the constraint generally means that you've got you've got a Hamiltonian mechanics, but there's some there, there, there's some of these kind of phase space coordinates which you really needed, which have been which which instead of being able to vary, to, to vary and have been have been fixed, have been fixed to be zero or something. So so you've got constraints like this. So anyway, and so you have to introduce. So anyway, this this then becomes a long story. So yeah, and and I can um. So what what ha so I think the bottom line here is that this this Lagrangian story and, and the and the principle of least action kind of sounds like a very very nice um, story about mechanics, but um, what, one one problem with it is that the the standard story of the Lagrange transform and how you're going to turn just turn it into a um, in, into a conventional Hamiltonian system and then work with that and then quantize that. You know, as Dirac said, you were supposed to. That actually, very often, even in the simplest cases, like if you try to quantize Maxwell's equations, it's not going to work. And so there's a long anyway. But it, and I'll, I'll say a bit when we we'll discuss electrodynamics later on, and we'll see kind of anyway. We'll we'll see kind of the reason. There's a very interesting phenomenon causing this the failure of this and the failure of this to be a decent phase space, and it's um it's can be understood in something we'll call the, the fact that you've got something called gauge freedom, that you've got, even though you thought you'd specified some nice initial data and that you would have a, a, a single valued kind of um, evolution what we, from that initial data, the problem is that there's this extra gauge symmetry, which means that you, had that the, you don't actually have the, the, this initial data you know, will, will, can evolve into many, many different possibilities related by this gauge freedom. So, so that's that's kind of that's what's what's going on here. But I think maybe just the bottom line to say it, just to watch out that if people set, try to sell you a story starting with Lagrangian mechanics and saying we're just gonna we're gonna do this, then um, you've at, at at some point very very soon you know, you're gonna run into a an important mechanical system where things are gonna get the story that you're being told about how to relate it to Hamiltonian mechanics and to make it look like a nice Hamiltonian system is not going to work. Okay. That's that. And I think I won't say any more about, about that, but, but I, in, in the notes, I also then wrote down, I mean, there, there's one other thing you can do. And yeah, let me, but I'll tell you a couple more things about Hamlet, about Lagrangian mechanics. So, so when, so you can, I guess one, is you can, um, uh, you can use uh, HPJQ minus L. As Hamiltonian, and then you know when the Legendre transform behaves properly, then you you can show and show that you know that if um that that, that under under good conditions you can show that the order of the that Hamilton's equation. Are, are the same thing as the other little Lagrange equation. So it's a fairly simple calculation. Just to, if, you, if you work out what the Hamilton, tell me what the Hamilton, if you, if, if you replace this QJ, if, if, here's the whole problem. I mean, can you invert that, that PJ is DL dQ dot J? Can, can you invert that and find Q dot J in terms of PJ? If you can, then you have a nice function of Qs and Ps here. You figure out what Hamilton's equations say, and then you then it matches up with what the Lagrange equations say. And then now maybe the second thing is that uh, is to talk about is, is the way you talk about um, sy symmetries. Um, 
And so, 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 so the main theorem that the, you, the main tool that you use in the Lagrangian formalism. So in Lagrangian formalism, what you're doing is is look for look for um, variations. Um, look for yeah, given. So uh, let's say let's say let's say let's take if x is some, is in, is in, in some Lee. So, so you get some, you're going to have some group, and you're going to say this is a group of symmetries. Well, if you've got some kind of uh, Lie algebra element, some kind of infin infinitesimal group element near the identity, infinitesimal change away from the I identity is x. Um, you, uh, you, so say, 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 g, g. So, so this is always going to involve g x on on the configuration space. of the QJ. Okay. So the, the story about symmetry is in the Lagrangian formalism. In the Lagrangian formalism, all you've really got is the configuration space. And you're, moving around, you're moving around in it. So you want to have, you want to you want to look at um, groups that act in the configuration space. So for instance, things like, like rotations and translations, the Euclidean group is going to act, it's going to be one thing. And you may have other groups that act in your configuration space. But then, for if x and g, then you're going to have, you're going to have, uh, you, so you're going to have some, in, some, in, for, for some infinitesimal variation away from the identity, you're going to have some infinitesimal variation in the, um, of the, of the q's. You have delta q j of x. So if you, if you know how the group is acting on the configuration space, then infinitesimally, you get you have the Lie algebra is going to get is going to be these give you these infin, is these infinitesimal changes in, in, the, in the Q's, and you know you're going to get so 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 there's going to be some anyway so 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 depending upon what x well anyway you you, you can this this is almost by definition is kind of what a what an infinitesimal symmetry change change is on, on this thing, and then and then what you want to do and then you have um so recall. All that uh, B L B Q dot J J delta Q J was was the same at um, T zero and T one for Delta S. So if you really were at a critical point, if you're at a critical point, and now and now you don't fix the behavior at the initial and final points, but you allow it to vary, then if you want to, to, to be at a critical point, then you're going to have that the this quantity is going to be the, the same at, at t is equal to t zero and t is equal to t one. So what you have, um, so what this implies is that delta x. Uh, delta dq, dl dq, j, and then delta qj of x are, are, are conserved quantities. So there, there's a more complicated, very small complicated versions of the story, but this is what's um, and this this is what's called the uh, other called no, no there's theorem. Okay. Another theorem says that you can, if you've got a group that acts on your, on your configuration space, and it um. Oh, sorry. So G X configuration space, if X, and and you have that leave. Actually, let me let me better maybe better say this on configuration space. Configuration space, leaving L invariant. Yeah. So, so, so the basic point here is, is not what you, you can look at, at at any kind of 
action of, of a group on the configuration space. But what you're interested in is um, group access to the configuration space that, that actually, you know, where, where that don't change L. Okay. And so, and you know, that, 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 anyway, that, 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 don't, that don't change L, that, are, that are leave L, L invariant, then those, those, are, those are what you're going to call symmetries. Those, and those, if you, if you look at what those symmetries are doing to the delta QJs, and you and you you look at you, you look at this you, you look at this guy, this this guy you, you now have some some conserved quantities, and the and, and these quantities have to stay the same, you know, at, at the beginning and at the end of some, some classical trajectory. That's the idea. Um, and so I won't actually did I. Sorry, I, I got a, there's a delta a D delta, delta Q dot. Sorry. Okay. And and so 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 so, so, so these are in, so the simplest example of this kind of phenomenon is if you if you just think about translations. So if you have some Lagrangian which is translation invariant, like the free particle Lagrangian, then the delta Q J under translation is just going to be some. You know, some infinitesimal shift of, by a constant to the delta qj. And then in, in this free particle case, dl dq dot j is, is just the um, it, 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 it is, is, is just the momentum. Okay. And, and so what this is telling you then is that translation symmetries cause the momentum to be conserved. Right? And that's so that's kind of what you Anyway, that, that, that's the general principle that you expect that, that translation symmetries have these corresponding things called momenta, which are the, thing, the things that generate them, and that's that's what that's what this is telling you in the simplest case. So in some in some sense, this is just kind of a, a little bit jazzed up version of that. Instead of just thinking about you know uniform translation, infinitesimal translations of the QJ, you're doing something like that mixes them around, maybe rotates them into each other or something. Then you're going to get you're going to get um, you're going to get kind of generalizations of, of, of notion momentum that are going to be conserved. Um, yeah. Question: So does the x in the lead group acts on anything, or is it just rotation-wise you're saying? No. So, so 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 you should think of this x just mean it, it, it's just some infinitesimal group element. You should, you should think of it as just, it's just some infinitesimal translation, some infinitesimal rotation. Or whatever. So everything is classical here. So there's no um, there's no rep there's no quantum mechanics or representations or, or any of any of that. It's just uh, so this is just kind of you've, you've got some group which which you think of it as being you know a group the group of translations of the configuration space or the group of rotations of the configuration space and and x is just something you know that g is is yeah. g is approximately equal to the identity plus Plus x, you know, plus high order. So, so, so x is just some kind of first order infinitesimal change near the identity. That's all. Yeah. That's it. So that that's all that's going on. So you, you don't really need much of the whole apparatus of of, of Lie groups or anything. But um, anyway, this is that's all that's happening here. Okay. Okay. So so, so that's pretty much the standard. So. Um, maybe the things to things to watch out about the story. So, so this is the standard story that you hear. Um, one. So, 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 so the, the reason I'll, I'll say the, the reason that this is this is very popular. So, so this is is not such a popular point of view if people are teaching quantum mechanics. Um, you know, non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Once you start doing quantum field theory, this is a very popular point of view because this allows you to. Um, Anyway, this allows you to, to, to treat space and time kind, kind of symmetrically, okay? So L is just, you just have an action, which is just some function on the trajectories, and so you, you don't actually have, you don't, you don't actually have to break up things into space and, and, and time variables in the way you have to do in, in a Hamiltonian, in the standard kind of Hamiltonian picture. So this is why this is very, if you want to kind of maintain this kind of relativistic space-time invariance, and you so, so what you do in quantum field theory courses is you, is you then just start saying, okay, well now let's just look at, you know, everything is based upon picking a, a Lagrangian functional and picking it and, and, and making sure that it is invariant under, um, 
you know, yeah. it's a very under, you know, relativistic space time tra 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 transformations. And then, and then, and then studying, and then, and then study, studying that. But um, the, so that's good. I mean, there the, are the, the, one problem with this, this doesn't actually. This, this, in some ways, this, this isn't as powerful as the, um, as the Hamiltonian formalism. The Hamiltonian formalism kind of knows a lot more about. The Hamiltonian formalism is kind of based on this infinite dimensional Lie algebra of, of these, um, the end. This infinite dimensional Lie algebra of, of functions of the Poisson bracket. So it, it, it actually has a, a lot more um, built into it. Um, it has a much bigger invariance group built into it. Which, but but and in particular, which allows you to think about transformations that um, transform the Qs into Ps that mix Qs and Ps. So transformations that mix Qs and Ps that have that give you an interesting moment map or interesting story in the Hamiltonian formalism are often kind of in, in, invisible in, in this formalism. You kind of can't can't see them. So um, anyway, so 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 the two different methods have kind of different different aspects, but. But if you again, when you're in one of these good cases, what you, you, you could you actually can just show that this story is really the same thing as the Hamiltonian mechanics story. That that this you know this guy is exactly when you're in this good in, in this good story that p's are really the same thing as q dots. This this is this is actually just exactly the moment that for 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 some anyway for for a group act that's acting. On the configuration space, and then has the same action on the on, on the um, momentum space variables. So, so you get there, there's a good, I mean, two stories are, are are consistent in 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 this kind of good case. Okay, so that's so that, that's about all that I want to tell you about about classical mechanics. So, so this is the anyway. There, 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 there's this different story which you're often told at the beginning of a quantum field theory class about. Well, hey, you know, let's here, here's here's Lagrangian mechanics, and here's Noether's theorem, and here's how symmetries work. But now, the problem is if you so if if if, if you're just going to do so if 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 you're just going to do canonical quantization, which is based upon you know, on Hamil the Hamiltonian formulas and knowing what Qs and Ps are, then this 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 doesn't go very far between. The, so, so, so one thing you could do, so so possible, so so what so possibilities is if you, if you start with L and uh, its symmetries. Well, one thing you can do is is you can go so define dj is dl dq q dot j and then do canonical quantization. So 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 one possible thing you can do is just to um, Anyway, do try to do this Lagrange transform. Put yourself in the Hamiltonian formalism, and then do exactly what I've been talking about for the, you know, for, for the earlier part of this class, where it's going to do canonical quantization. So this is one thing you can do. And, and, and older older quantum field theory book, books. If you look at what at what people did, a quantum field theory book from the fifties or sixties, you'll find that they were typically. Um, this is essentially what they were doing. They were saying. You know, let's study these different Lagrangians because that's a really cool way of understanding how to get relativistic invariant dynamics. But then we're going to just go, the book, but we have to go to a Hamiltonian formalism because we that's the only thing way we know how to quantize. You know, because that's we, is, is to do canonical quantization. We need P's and Q's. Okay, but now that the second thing, so the more what's more, the more modern thing in most kind of newer textbooks in quantum field theory try to do this. Is what's called um, path angle quantization. Um, I'm trying to decide how much. So, so, so this is actually kind of kind of a long story. Um, 
maybe let me test, let me just say the, um, what's the right way to, Well, okay, let me let, 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 okay. Let, let, let me let me start with start with this and and try try and try, try and give one motivation one motivation for this. But here's the idea. So so the um, okay. And, and actually, before I, before I start with this, I, I should actually say that maybe there's some. The, the, the thing about pathological quantization is that it focuses a lot differently. It, it, it focuses on, on quite different objects than the ones that than the ones that we're used to. So this is this really doesn't depend so much on the. Um, this this doesn't depend so much on the state space. Maybe it's better. Okay, let me first tell you a simple, the basic example of of, um, of pathological quantization. So let, let's let's do the. Um, let, let, let's let's do a particle moving, and, and you, it's got a configuration variable. And so let's do let's find. Um, so 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 if we want to know given, if we want to, um, well, let's let's compute. And this way, so you want to compute one one of the basic things you want to compute. In, if you're if you're studying this uh, quantum mechanics of a, of, a, of a particle or a particle of potential, is what you want to compute is um, if it's something that if you if you start in a state. So, so, so this is this is this is a state that an eigenstate of the position. So this is in this standard um, Hamiltonian and standard Schrodinger formalism. This would be delta of q minus q zero. So if we, if we know so, so so the idea is that you know you know your your and and, and this and, and let's 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 say that this that we, we know that a time t is equal to, to t zero. This 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 thing is a delta function. We we've, we've localized this thing at a given time. Okay, then if we want to figure out how is that going what what's going to happen? How is that going to evolve? Well, what you want to do is you want to then you want to then evolve it with the um, e to the Minus i is the Hamiltonian for, for some time t, okay. and then so 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 so, so this initial delta function thing is going to is going to change to some to some other function, and you want to kind of evaluate that, you know, against uh, you want to figure out what 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 that is at, at time. You know, you, you want to evaluate that against a delta function at time t and figure out what, um, you know, if you start out at a delta function this time, what do you get? What are you going to get at a later time? And, and th this kind of gives you pretty much all the information for the kind of standard thing, basic thing you want to know. But it, if if you started out with not a delta function but some general function, you could write it as an you know you can, you can think of it as a superposition of delta functions. You could write it as an integral over this guy. And then you, if you know how this, if you know what this operator is going to do to that, and then you just evaluate it against the, these delta functions, and you'll, you'll 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 find you'll find the later. So this gives this gives you can use to get to get psi of q t knowing. Zero. Or if if you like, you can tell you can. This is like this kind of solve this kind of, this thing kind of solves the Schrodinger equation. It tells you if you know what the initial data is for all q is at time zero, then you if you want to know what you, what the solution is here, you could you, you could just try and solve the Schrodinger equation. Or but you can think of that as being that you're you're operating by the time evolution on. On the superposition of these states, and then you're trying to see what coefficients you get with respect to these states. And and we actually work this out. This this is the propagator, and so this guy is actually. So we we, we actually found for, for the free. Um, 
for, for, for the free particle, we found that this was something like the square root of m over i 2 pi t. And then there's an e to the minus m over 2 i t. And then there's a qt minus q0. Okay. So this is the kind of, this is what's called the free particle propagator. And, and I explained there, there's, there's some very, very funny things about this expression. I mean, one is that this is a, that this is a phase and as, anyway, as, as anyway, so th this is a phase that's varying faster and faster as, as, as time goes on. It's a weird thing. And um, anyway, so, so, th so this is actually a, a gadget which actually makes much better sense if you don't think of T, but think of, think of, um, Anyway, if, if, if you do an analytic continuation to, 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 to make IT real, then you're actually, then you're, you're, you're looking at a solutions to the um, uh, heat equation and this whole, this whole thing is actually well-defined. So more actually really, but this is a weird, this is actually is a gadget that really kind of makes sense at, um, for, imagine, for imaginary time but it's kind of the analytic continuation from imaginary time to real time. As you approach the boundary of real time, it's very funny things are happening, but, but it's, you, you, can, you, can make, you can make sense of what's going on. Okay, so, so now the, um, what, what, the, the, what the path interval method says is that it's gonna give you a way, a different way of, of computing this, which is not just, um, which, which is not by, not by trying to evaluate this operator and exponentiating it, and which is not by solving the, the Schrodinger equation, but but it's by kind of breaking up the breaking up the breaking up this operator in an interesting way. So let me tell you how that works. And so, so the idea. Is to take um, uh, is to is to break up to evaluate and as n goes to infinity. Uh, what you've done is is you take um, qt. So you take. <coughs> You, 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 you evolve for a time t divided by n, so it's the, what the e to the e to the minus i t over n h, and then you you, you do it n times. So, so you do this. And so 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 you 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 break up the um, so so essentially the idea the idea was happening. This idea goes back to I think. Um, Dirac evidently had some version of this idea, and then Feynman worked, worked it out in a much more detail. But the idea is that um, you can you can kind of think, think of this as being, you know, on, on short time scales, what's happening is um, something is anyway. You, uh, you, you, you can you, you can think think of this, this 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 operator in terms of kind of path of paths of, of what's happening at each time and and on. And if you looked at what if you look at what's happening in that, that, that thing that, that I erased, if you look at what it's going to do on very short time scales, it's going to have have, have, a, have a fairly simple behavior. And you can think of anyway, and and and, and you, you you can use that to motivate what I'm going to get here finally, which is this um, so-called path integral. But let me right, so 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 what you're going to do is so so your your problem with this that the problem with doing this. Is that really h? H depends. H depends on uh, has you know on h is equal to let's call it um, uh, h is equal to k plus v. So kinetic energy and potential energy, and this depends on p's, and this depends on q's. Okay. And, and your your problem with exponentiating this guy is that these these guys don't commute. 
right? So, it, I mean, if, if H just depended on Qs, you can work in this Q basis and, and you could just evaluate the exponential. If it just depended on Ps, you could be in the, if it was a free particle case, you would just depend on Ps. You could work in the P basis, you just exponentiate this guy and you're done. But your problem, when, if you have a potential, is that P and Q don't commute. So what, what you want to do, though, is, is use, yeah, anyway, you, you use the fact, anyway, there's a, so, 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 so the, what, what happened, you use the, the fact that the limit, that this, you can actually treat them a little bit at that, that, that commute if, if you go to the limit, and you, this is, Anyway, there, there, you, this is a kind of a story about linear algebra or related to this Baker Campbell Hausdorff, or it's a, also a story about operators. It's called the, something called the Trotter product formula. It tells you that you can do this, um, that this, 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 this is, that this guy is, is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of the um, p to the minus i. Uh, K over n um, e to the minus i v over n. So the idea is that you know in the limit as these op as these operators become small, the anti the the fact that they don't commute is a, is of lower order and is going to vanish in the limit. Okay, so there's there's some this is not quite the the product of these, but it, it's it's product of these plus something of lower order, and that and, and as you take the limit, that lower order, of higher order, that higher order thing is going to go away. Okay, and then then what you do is is you you then um, is it so then insert. Insert in 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 this in this infinite in, in the infinite product of alternate um, versions of the identity. The standard way to write that you, you can write this as being that the um, yeah that, that if you Project on the Q and then times Q, and you you do that for all Qs. You're, you're going to get the identity operator, or the same thing for for Ps. You're going to get the identity operator, and uh, and, and so 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 the, the game you play is that you basically you you uh, you have this and you turn this guy. This guy you want to evaluate into this infinite product, and then you alternately at alternate points in here put in this guy or this guy, and then on then then you evaluate this guy on 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 the using on the p side because this, because this, this, this operator these are these p operators so it evaluated on these guys it gives you just um these guys are p eigenvectors these guys are q eigenvectors you evaluate them on, on this guy. And what you get is, is, is you, you then get a um, you, you have we have one integral for each of these endpoints where you where you you've you've inserted these 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 resolution of the identity operators, and so you you end up with an, an infinite number in the limit. You have an infinite number of of um of, of these integrals, and so you end up with this with this infinite dimensional integral. And here I have to. I'm just getting, working out the, working out how this happens. And again, this is in the notes. It's in pretty much every physics, almost every physics textbook I know of. But you, what you end up with is that the um, you find that the QT e to the minus i h e q zero is some limit. As n goes to infinity of one over q pi to the n, you get these guys, and then a product a is equal to one to n of two of n, n times two integrals, which and they're they're 
the integrand is d q j d p d at some at some t well d d q at some at some times d p s at, at some times, and then the what the, what you get here is the exponential of e to the i times the integral zero to t of uh, p q dot minus h of q p d p. Okay, and then and, and this guy is the um. Okay. Anyway, it, 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 it's this guy. Okay, so if you um. So 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 this is a, so 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 what, then your your idea is that the is that you interpret this as as um so you interpret so so interpret as a an, an integral overall trajectories in phase space. Okay. So, so, so what, what this is doing is you've so you so you're integrating over you're now in your in your phase space your Q's and P's and you're if if you know that you're at some initial point and you want to, and you want to find out what what's going to happen how are you are you going to be able to get to what's the what's the amplitude for getting to some later point well you you, you basically want to, want to integrate over all over all possible and this is why this is called a path integral. Okay, and so and it's just because you've got anyway this that's that's just an interpretation of what this thing is. Now this is so, so this is a, this is the kind of standard story. And well, I have a question. So, yeah. so can you do something similar in the Lagrangian like mix? Yeah. Oh, something and, and, like that. Like you choose a you choose a series of points. Uh, Time damage or something similar. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah, we're gonna, yeah, so, so see, the, the problem is the reason I had to introduce the P's, what was, you know, exactly to get, to get this factorization so that I, my problem was that Q and P don't commute. So, so I, I couldn't just, um, anyway, the, 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 this, this argument that I made here, the reason I wanted to make the argument in this form is that it, it, in some sense, it, it actually is a legitimate argument that, that you know if you define this limit properly, you know <laughs> this is true. It's actually so. So this, so this actually cut, cut works. How the, the thing which is not true, the, the thing which is which is bogus is this. So I mean, I'll, I'll say get this to the Lagrangian point of view in a minute. But the um, but so so this is what's called this is what's called a phase space pattern. So the I mean. This 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 product product formula argument and everything I did is, is is perfectly true and it's true that if you define this limit of, of these iterated integrals appropriately you will actually get you'll get the right you'll get the right answer the problem is that you actually kind of can't think of there, there there's something really seriously wrong with thinking of this as being a any any kind of legitimate integral over overall paths because it, and, and, and to, to understand why something is really wrong about this you have to realize that I mean, these are paths in phase space so each point in here you're talking about the system you're talking about lo localite trying to localize the system in, in phase space it, that you know you it, it's it's got both a well-defined p and q and you know you can't do that and the fact that you can't do that means you had to do something really funny is that you had to Alternate P's and Q's. You had to jump back and forth between P's and Q's, and you and, and, and that makes this work. But 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 it really doesn't. It means that that this gadget you, you've had here really is is not these phase space path integrals. You'll often see people write down. There's something really disturbing about them. They're not actually. They only make sense in some very. You know, if they really did all that you would like them to do, they would violate all sorts of. Principles. They they would they would allow you to localize in P and Q space. They would tell you that you can um, you, you, you they they would tell you in a unique way how to um yeah you know, how to quantize any 
polynomials in P's and Q's, they would they would violate the Nogo theorem that says that there's no good way to do that. And so, they, so, so it, if this really was a legitimate integral on paths, it, 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 um, it, it would violate various principles. Okay. But but what you can do, what, what is true, so it, it, it is true that this this calculation makes sense. It's not true that that you know that trying to say, oh, once I know this, I can just think of this as being an integral over all over all these paths, and then I can then change variables and write that integral in, in a different set of variables. That's not going to work. This 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 integral is only going to work because of a very specific way you've done it. If you try and it, it doesn't have the kind of doesn't have the ability to change variables you what you would like. Okay. So 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 that's the phase space path integral. But now the, the thing that you could do though is that in many cases what you'll find once you have the what you have this integral is in many cases you can the the, the P's so as long as P is, is only occurring um is occurring no worse than quadratically here. So you've got a, a linear term and a quadratic term then what you can do is you can you can just do the p integration. So, so, so what you do is you do you do is, is you do the um the p you do, do the infinite number of p integrations. And and in, in these good case in these good cases, what you're going to it turns out what what you get is you get something something that's proportional. And notice that also there's something very funny going on with normalization of these things you have to worry about. But, but you get something that's proportional to the limit that then goes to infinity of these d um, and, uh, of, of, of of these. J the n of integral infinity to infinity e q of t j okay e, and then then you have an e to the i um, and it turns out that the, then you have an integral of, of the Lagrangian of q and of q and q dot okay so. If you so so so, so th this didn't make sense in general, but 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 if P was again P was not doing anything funny. P P is no worse than quadratic, and so again you're you're in this you're in this situation here where the um where where you actually have have a good Legendre transform. Then you can you can do these integrals, and you just have this integral. And this is so. So, and, and this is what what people normally say is the, the Lagrangian path. And this is the. So this is the. So what I just wrote down was kind of the phase space path integral, really, the Hamiltonian path integral, really, and it's it's um. You, you want to be very careful thinking about that guy as, as an integral over paths, but this guy actually makes a lot more sense as an integral over paths. And so this is the uh, this is the Lagrangian path integral. Really. And, and, and so the, the the philosophy is that what is that now now you want to think of this, this as just being an infinite as 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 the, the integral over over all paths gamma of e to the i s of gamma. Anyway, so 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 this is this is the basic idea of the path integral philosophy. The path integral philosophy says well. You know, you can, and I, I you, you can motivate this through the the, the way that through from from the from the Hamiltonian formalism in the good cases in the way that I just did. But your bottom line is 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 this that if you if you want to understand how to quantize a theory, all you need to do is is work in the Lagrangian formalism, work, work with with work with configuration space variables, and then just in it, you know, and then the way the way to understand if you you know what your pro what the amplitude is to, to be to get from one point in phase space to another point in phase space is there's a the the the, ac the action is going to tell you that there's a, a certain kind of classical trajectory this is going to be delta s equals zero 
but the, but the idea is that quantum mechanics somehow come, comes about from saying that we should now integrate over 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 all possible things. Okay. That's so, so, this, so that's the philosophy, and then maybe so so that there are lots of there there are lots of problems with this philosophy, I should say. But um, maybe one one the, the the first thing to say about this about this philosophy is that this 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 I is kind of problematic, and he 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 he's he's the same. The fact that you're in, that you're integrating, you know. <laughs> Your problem is that for, for every the contribution from, from here to here is, is always going to be a phase. It's always going to be of amplitude one, no matter where you are. So you're trying to integrate over a space, which and everything is going to come down to you're trying to get an answer, which in some sense depends upon a very delicate cancellation of phases. And, and, and it's, it's not actually... I mean, there, there is no kind of legitimate notion of integral which is going to do what you want. What is true is that if you, you can, again, you can analytically continue this I to, you know, to, to if, you, if you, anyway, you, you can analytically continue the problem and, and make this I become a minus sign. And then you're going to, then, then you actually do have a well-defined integral. And that's called the Euclidean path integral. But um, so, 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 so that's one problem. Um, the I think I think the other things to, to say about these integrals is that the um, you can make sense if um, so to, to to make sense of this sense you want to um, or one you want I you want to this is called Wick rotating the I okay. to, to to get rid of I to to, to get to, to you know, wick rotate to eliminate the I. And the other thing is that um, if, if S is quadratic in Q Q dot, then you can then you have a you have a Gaussian integral. So, so what, what ends up happening is that if you um, if, if you're if this s is some arbitrary function of the q's and q dots, there it, it's really very hard to know how to how to make any sense of this integral. It's an integral over an infinite-dimensional space. You want to, you have to you have to worry about defining it so that the um, you can try to define it by some limiting process, but you have to make sure that the the answer you're going to get depends upon how it does it is independent of how you take the limit in some decent way, and that actually is not um, so. So what actually what 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 the bottom line tends to be that it, if, if if s is quadratic in your underlying variables q and q dot, then what you can do is you can say aha you know even though this is infinite dimensional, I know how to do I can put it in the form of a Gaussian, and I know how to do Gaussians, and I know how to do Gaussians in infinite dimensions even, and just and and you can do that if if this is non-Gaussian, if this guy is, um, if the Q, if, if he's more than quadratic in the Q and Q dot variables, and it's a non-Gaussian integral, then it becomes a very, very interesting and a very, very tough, you know, mathematical problem of, of how to make sense of these integrals. And that that's then becomes kind of this basic problem in, um, in, in, in quantum field theory or in, 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 in quantization is how to make sense of these, how to make sense of, of this guy outside of the of the of the Gaussian case, outside of kind of the free particle or harmonic oscillator case. And that, that becomes very, very and, and and it's believed in some cases you can do it, other cases you can't. You can try and put it on a computer and do it. But I mean there, there, there's a long, long story about that. Okay. So I think I want to that's about all I want to say here, and I'm just hoping that this is useful if you've if you've actually taken a physics course where you've seen this 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 kind of given as the motivation for starting into quantum field theory. I just want to kind of connect this up to what what we're doing. But um, there is, it, it, it is the relationship between this this kind of quantization and canonical quantization is is, is kind of highly non-trivial. It really that they're not. 
Yeah, I mean, there, the, you could you could easily if you think that you're really doing the same thing, you can easily come up with cases where you get into trouble and very and different things happen. Um, and, and and maybe what one one thing to to read, to think about in this case, one th one thing that, that's kind of funny about this picture is that you um. This gives you a nice story about how you're going to evaluate, you know, vacuum to vacuum expectation values of certain operators. But if you want to actually ask, like, you know, wait a minute, what's the Hilbert space? What do, what, do the, what do the states look like? It turns out that's that's kind of hard to say in this. Well, yeah. Anyway, yeah. you can say that there are L2 functions on the configuration space, but if your configuration space is infinite dimensional, does that really make sense? And, Anyway, I, I think I better I better stop here. But I've gone on far too much, but that's this this is about as far as I want to go into kind of hooking up what what I'm going to do to what you'll find in in a typical um, in a typical physics book. I mean, I, I'm not actually going to tell you anything more about the about these things. I'm not, but but what I am going to do is um, I, I I'm going to stick to the case really where of which really corresponds to to free to free field theories. Where S is really kind of quadratic in the underlying objects. And, and if you wanted the pathological way of doing this would be to be doing infinite dimensional Gaussian integrals. And I'm going to, and I'll be using other methods. I'll just, I'm going to be basically using the, the um, you know, the, the fact that we know, that we know how we know how to canonically quantize quadratic quadratic operators um, because. You know, you know, using kind of symmetry principles that, that these are the things which generate the, um, you know, the, the symplectic group or orthogonal group actions. So we'll, uh, I'll, I'll be using those methods, but this is that. So I guess I better stop there. So any any questions about any of this, especially if this may be very confusing. It, it, this is really confusing if you haven't seen it before, but maybe if you have seen some of this stuff before, and does, does this make any sense? Um, um, for the rig rotation that converted to including integral, yeah. Like, uh, I remember seeing that somewhere, but let's see. What I want to ask is like, how do we, after integrating, doing the including integral, then reverse this rig rotation, go back? Like, by which I mean, like, do the reverse such that like it's not really doing anything. Well, so the, the the general belief, okay, so the so the, so, so <laughs> I I should say that this your your question is something I've been th thinking about a very very great deal recently because I'm I'm very very interested in in the, anyway I've been very very interested in this question of of, of the relation between the Euclidean picture and this and the and the real time picture. Um, but, but what what I the thing to say is that um, people what what people ca calculate is they're like you can think of what they're calculating is, is you, you've got fields they're defined at, at some times t say so say well let's, so let's, let's take something like this okay. the basic kind of thing you want to calculate is so you want to calculate, you know, you're going to have these fields which which depend upon time and space, and you want to and, and you want to find out, you know, what what happens, if, you know, what happens if you what's the expectation value if you, you know, insert this operator at, at time zero and this operator at, at time t, right? And this and this is something that's going to be called the called the Whiteman function w t. Now, so 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 the, so the idea is that if you could if you calculate this for for real time t, you get this Whiteman function. But but you but if you the Wick rotation says you know do whatever way you were doing this calculation wherever you saw t, if you take t goes to i let's say i tau. You know, take time to imaginary time, and then express this in terms of, and, and so in some sense, then W2 of I tau. So what you want to do is you're going to, in some sense, analytic, you can think of this now as a complex variable. 
you're going to analytically continue it. Now. And, and, now you, and now you're going to get something that's called a Schwinger function. Okay. So if you, if you think of this as a function of tau and not of t, you get the, the Schwinger function. And so in, in some sense, the, the, the legitimate path integrals, the legitimate well-defined path integrals compute this guy. Okay. And then what you want to do is you want to somehow claim that you can, you can think of time as a complex variable and you can use, you know, and, and, and your idea is that these, these things are, that, that <clears throat> this is a well-defined function. You can extend it to complex values of tau and then when you get to when you get to to, to, to real time t, you, and then you can analytically continue and, and get something at real time t. Though something is funny as you approach the real axis because you're you know, you're getting these weird anyway you're, you're getting these weird infinitely oscillating things. So 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 you have them. So so this guy actually has a much more th 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 these guys are actually are decently well defined decent functions. And you can, you can, these are the guys that you can imagine really writing down path integrals that will we'll cal we'll calculate. But, but the idea is, is that quick rotation is, is, is really that of analytic continuation. The time, in some sense, is supposed to be a complex variable, and you're supposed to be able to go from the imaginary axis to the real axis. And, uh, and, 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 and then you'll, you'll get the, uh, the thing which you, which you would use in, in your physical calculation. I don't know, does that help? And how do we justify the fact that, like, basically here we're assuming that the ordering of first doing rig rotation and then doing the integration doesn't matter? Well, uh, what, what I would claim is that is that you, you actually can't. You, if you, if you try and write this guy as a path integral, it's going to be one of the, it's going to be this integral over these these. It's an infinite-dimensional integral over phases, which really does, does not actually have any well-defined meaning. What does have a well-defined meaning is, is this, is, is the Wick rotated path integral. Wick rotated path integral is, can actually be made legitimate sense of. But then when, once you've done it, it's an infinite-dimensional integral, but it, it depends on this on the single parameter, tau. If you can do this integral, you can just, you know, if, if it really is an if it really is a holomorphic function in, um, in this variable, then you could just you could just evaluate that holomorphic function at, at real t. Or, or actually, what you have to do is you have to actually take you actually have to take define this as a at the limit of a complex of a, of a you have to take, take this as really the limit as epsilon goes to zero of of, of t plus i epsilon. In some sense. Yeah, so it's the thing which actually makes sense is is, is kind of the, the boundary value of a holomorphic function. That's what these guys are. These guys are actually quite tricky objects mathematically, these are these Whiteman functions, whereas these Schwinger functions are actually perfectly nicely well-defined things. I don't know if that makes makes sense. But it um but but what you'll that formally, you know, in, in a lot of manipulations you'll see in, in physics textbooks, there's this kind of I think the the, the general philosophy that people pursue is that. Well, let's formally just just work in real time and, and and act as if and act as if these integrals make sense. And then, you know, if if push comes to shove and, and we realize we, we've got an answer which doesn't make sense, then what you do is you go back and say, oh, well, this really is the analytic continuation of of a more legitimate calculation that would be done in in, in, in real time. I mean, in imaginary time. And, and if, if you go and talk to the people in the physics department who are doing path integrals on a computer, but those guys, those guys are, eva they're, they're evaluating this. They're certainly not trying to put this on, they're not trying to put this on a computer. They're putting this on a computer. And then when they have their answer, trying to make sense of it in real time. Okay. But, um, but, but this is a, but but th this part of the story is actually fairly. Uh, this is rel relatively well understood. The fact the relationship between these correlation functions in real and imaginary time. But the uh, if you start thinking about this some more, the thing which is kind of fascinating me these days is if you um, if you start thinking about 
like, hey, wait a minute, what's it? What, you know, I understand what states are over here, real time states. What are where? What's the space of states over here? Now here I have states and operators, but here I just seem to have these infinite dimensional integrals. And you know, what, what were, you know, what? How do the operators work? How do the states work over here? And, and that that becomes a much much more interesting question, which is very hard. This gets tricky. But 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 this part this this is the basic the basic idea that you're trying to compute things like this and they really make sense in imaginary time. And so they're, they're kind of the boundary values of the continuations from the imaginary time. Another thing that's tangentially related to this, like I read somewhere that for some like topological term in Q of T, somehow like whether or not you do rotation or not, like the term somehow is always imaginary, which I cannot make sense of. Yeah, okay. Uh, like, is there an easy way to intuitively understand that? Um, yeah, and, and, and that, now you're talking about something I actually, when I wrote my PhD dissertation on. <laughs> so, 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 so the point is, when I say that, okay, so, 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 some kind of, if you take like the standard kind of velocity squared kind of term, that's, you know, an, an e to the i x dot squared term. Th th this kind of term, when you analytically continue it, um, what, what, when, you, when you analytically continue ta time, th th this then goes to the e to the minus interval of Anyway, so, so, so this this guy is this is the kind of term that, that becomes perfectly well defined. But but there there are other kinds of terms here, like there's like a, like an e to the i. You're integrating around. You're integrating around some curve in phase space. I mean, there are other kinds of terms here, which when you when you analytically continue them, they're still imaginary. I won't. I won't um, and th this, I, I, this isn't quite right, but 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 the point is that there there's some kinds of terms that when you go when you rick rotate, you get rid of the. They don't become phases. They became not, They become nice, well behaved exponentials. There are other kinds of terms that when you rick rotate, there's still there's still a phase, and 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 a, and a typical. So the, the the example that like I worked on in um. In, in my dissertation was you know that if you if you're doing Yang, if you're doing Yang Mills theory, there's a in, in Yang Mills theory there, there there's there's the, the the action for Yang Mills fields that has a Minkowski space thing and what you want to do is you don't want to work with that you want to work with the Wick rotated version and that that's you do lattice gauge theory and this is what the guy is in physics are, are are now computing in the computers and what. People have been doing it for a long time. I was doing it even way back when in graduate school. But the, the problem was that there are also interesting terms, like I think this is what you've heard about in the um there are interesting quantum field theories, like like um churn simons. So churn simons, there are these things called like churn simons terms. And a churn simons term is, is exact or or a, or a theta. There's a Anyway, there are these topological terms which are in the form e to the i theta times a topological invariant of the number, and and these things under the, these the, the, here the i i the i the i doesn't go away, and so what you have to do is if you you have to worry about whether you know can I you know can can, can I you know, these integrals make make perfect sense, but what if I take these integrals and weight them by these by these phase factors like this? Does that does that still make sense? And that that, that that's a very that's that that's very hard to say. It's very hard to the problem is the techniques you have for making sense of those integrals. They rely upon some kind of positivity, and if you start throwing in phase factors, life becomes tricky. But um. But yeah, so, so, so that, that's a legitimate problem. But but uh, but I I, th I think the thing to say is that it's only your only hope of making sense of, of, of things like this is probably in in the Wick rotated thing because 
because because th this guy here is really going to kill you, whereas this guy here is well defined. But the part I mainly want to understand is like what makes these topological terms um, such that like what about them such, such that even after Rick rotate, like it's still imaginary in the phase. Well, they're just um. I don't. I, 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 I think maybe a, a better thing to say is that pretty much everything that I know, whenever people are talking about topological quantum field theory and writing down topological quantum field theories, they're they're always working in Euclidean space. They're always, I mean, there, there really is no kind of sensible definition of a topological field theory in Minkowski space, other than as a wick rotation of the, of the thing. So. So all so all of these discussions. I mean, if you it, it, whenever you're looking at a discussion by somebody of a topical they're 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 thinking about what's happening in the Euclidean signature. They're, everything they're doing is in Euclidean signature, and so I mean that that that's true of lots of things in, in quantum field theory in general. But it it's it's very very much true of topological quantum field theories. They really um they're really. And, and you can, you can and, and even you know what you're often trying to do in a topological quantum field theory, you're trying to evaluate topological invariance of of manifolds. Well, you know you you need you kind of want your manifold to be a manifold, a Ramanian manifold, you know, in a with a positive definite metric in order for any chance for it to kind of be compact and something understandable. If you're in Minkowski space and you've got some directions where where distance is positive, so other directions where distance is negative, other distances where it's zero. Yeah. You don't actually have a well-defined notion of topology anymore. I mean, to have a kind of standard notion of what it means, your standard notion of what a topological space is in a metric space is, is based upon having a positive definite metric. So, so all of these issues about topological quantum field theory, are pretty, they're, they're always kind of issues about um, you know Euclidean signatures because that's where the that's where you that's where you actually have a an interest to have a topology a manageable to, notion of topology to even talk about. Okay. Any anything else? Okay, so I guess we'll, if, if that, we'll uh, I'll stop here. But again, I'll be around for a while. So after I turn this off, if you want to come back and talk, please do. And then once this is over, so, so, so starting next time, I'll start on, um, I'll, I'll finally start talking about quantum field theories, but we'll start with kind of very simple free field theories in uh, their non-relativistic and really kind of the, just this question of, uh, you know, how do you go to, uh, how do you use kind of harmonic oscillator methods to talk about kind of our, not just a single particle moving around, but kind of arbitrary numbers of particles moving around at once. And that, that's what we'll start on next time. Okay. Okay. So, bye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.